afternoon. It's a great pleasure to introduce um, Ned Heinz from Rockefeller today as our speaker in the Simon Center. So Ned um, got his degree in, uh, where was it, in Williams College, I think his undergraduate his degree in Albany, and then was uh, at St. Louis he was a postdoc, and he came to Rockefeller in 1983. That's a long time. Yeah, <laughs> thanks it's, for telling it's, me. It's one year longer than I'm at MIT, so I was really surprised when I saw that. Um, so he's there and he's a hot use um, 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 medical researcher. So Ned has been interested always for in the diversity and complexity of the brain. And of course, the big issue here is heterogeneity of cells. And so he was the first one to use really bug engineering to insert these big constructs into, into the germline and getting specific expression of some marker in specific populations of cells. I think it was a very great tool which many people used. But still it was a transgene. And transgenes are affected by position effects, they're randomly integrating. I don't think it's the ideal thing. So the next step was really then to do it without any transgene, it was the trap. Um, um, the, the um, ribosome profiling, translation profiling system, which he did with uh, together with the Green Guards Laboratory and Miriam was the main mover on this and of course she is here. And that's, I think it's a, it's a great technology which I think is used a lot and I think he will talk about this. Nonette is interested in the epigenetic regulation in neurons, in neurons. things like DNA methylation, hydroxymethylation, meth uh, MECP2, um, um, method transfers and all these things. And so when I talked to him this morning and we tried to figure out what, do we know what HMC does, hydroxymethylation, or what MECP2 does? And then we came to the conclusion, you have no clue. It's really very complex, we just don't know what's going on. So he's using um, his interest really basically to probe into biochemical mechanisms of neural circuitry and of, of neurons. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you, Rudolf. It's a pleasure to be here, even though it took me forever to get here yesterday. Um, and I'd like to say I'm happy about Boston winning the Super Bowl, but it wasn't a very good way to win it. <laughs> In any case, I, I, I'm going to tell you <laughs> I'm going to tell you about my interests and um, sort of start at the beginning because I think it's important to understand how these develops in how I develop these interests. Um, so that we've known, is this not, this is not working. Wait a second. Let me see here. There's something on my computer, on your computer that's not, okay. Yeah. So it's been known for over 100 years um, mostly by studies by Ramon y Cajal, that the nervous system is composed of hundreds of cell types and that they are connected into circuits. And when I saw these drawings, I became fascinated with them. And the first thing I was interested in is, you know, what do these different cell types do? Why are there so many? There's no theoretical reason that I know of why you would need so many cell types. Um, so, for example, questions like, um, you know, why do, I can't see from there, um, for example, if you look at all these cell types, why when you, you mutate a gene that's expressed in all cells, do only Purkinje cells die? It has to do something with their biochemical makeup. Why in Alzheimer's disease are these cells the first to go almost 10 years before other cell types? And it seemed to me we couldn't understand that unless we really we're able to go in and experiment on these cell types indi individually. So what we did is generate, as Rudolf said, this me method called recombineering now for manipulating large DNAs, and we turn these drawings from nice drawings into mice. So this was really useful, um, but we didn't know enough about gene expression to be able to say, oh, I want to target, you know, these granule cells, I'm going to take a particular vector to target them. So we did a very large scale project, which was called the GenSat project. We actually made 14,000 transgenic lines. And this was over a 10 year period. Um, and the reason we did it is we wanted to be able to access essentially any cell in the nervous system of a mouse. Um, so we wanted to take 
diagrams like this, which was Ann Grabiel drew of the basal ganglia circuitry, which involves many different structures. Um, and in each structure involves probably dozens of cell types per structure, maybe a dozen in striatum, and ask what do each of these cells do in the behaviors controlled by a circuit like that. So to do that, you need lines. And you need lines that target all these different cell types. You need them in order to characterize the cells, manipulate the cells, find out what happens if you inactivate them. So for example, uh, if you want to know, you know, why there are two different populations of cortical thalamic neurons in layer six that target different structures in the thalamus, you'd like to be able to inactivate them independently and then assay what happens to behavior. Um, or if you wanted to actually look at different cell types in the thalamus, like the intralaminar nucleus uh, in this case, you know, you, you can't do this by picking at them. You need driver lines that will allow you to infect these cells or cross them with something and analyze their behavior. And in the context of this, we also found um, many cell types that we didn't know existed. So for example, there's a little region in mouse cortex that you can target reproducibly um, using multiple vectors. It's in layer two, three. We have no idea what this, why this is genetically defined as a separate cell population, but it could be the antecedent of a much larger structure, let's say in primate brains that has functional significance. So having done this, <clears throat> the question is, you know, what are these useful for? Um, and I've just described that, and actually we did it kind of as a public service because we circulated them to the community. There are a thousand labs using them. Um, and they, you know, they're using them for all sorts of optogenetic experiments, crosses into mutants, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's useful. But the problem with that, and oh, and I want to acknowledge the people who did this because this was done, we're not authors on these papers. So the project was started by myself and Mary Beth Hatton, and then these individuals worked for 10 years generating and characterizing these lines. If you think it's easy work, you're mistaken. These people really did a great job. Um, so then the question becomes, well, you know, is this good enough? And the answer is no, because if you're me and you're interested in molecules, biochemistry, and wine cells are specialized, you have to be able to determine what the molecular properties of specific cell types are um, and how those properties contribute to their specialized functions um, and perhaps how they're involved in circuit modulation and in disease. So what I'm going to tell you about um, has to do with method, the method that Miriam Heyman uh, derived in the lab, and that's the ability to translate and determine all translated proteins in a specific cell type. The way that was done was to tag ribosomes. Since ribosomes bind to mRNA, if you pull down the ribosome, you will pull down the mRNA and you can sequence it. So the process is very simple. You target that construct into, let's say, these layer six cells here. And instead of isolating the cells, the ribosomes in that cell line are labeled. You can take the whole torque cortex, grind up the cortex, make a post-nuclear supernatant, and then immunoprecipitate the RNAs that were being translated in this cell type away from the ones that were not present in that cell type. Sounds very simple. And in fact, the best piece of data, I, the one I like best, is what Miriam did this experiment where she immunoprecipitated and then cut the beads for EM and showed that on the surface of the beads are these beautiful polyribosomes. So you extract the RNA from that, um, and you can characterize what cells or what messages are being translated in any cell at any time. And this is tremendously useful. It's very accurate, reproducible. Miriam showed that by characterizing two extremely closely related cells, median spiny neurons and the stri striatum, that project either directly to the substantia nigra or indirectly. And without going through that data, what she was able to show is that all of the markers that were known, which was about a dozen, are um, immunoprecipitated from the correct cell type, and that there are about 300 molecules that distinguish this very closely related two cell types. So this was 
quite revealing because it said even in the simplest case, uh, these cells are very fine-tuned. You could confirm this by insight to hybridization, choose molecules that look like they should be functionally important in one cell type and not in another cell type, and then with Jim Surmeyer, uh, what Miriam uh, was able to show is that yes, it's predictive. If you assay the function in a given cell type, it's of course there in the cell type in which it is expressed. So that's fantastic because now we can tell which molecules are made in which cell type and try to understand their differentiated project or, or differentiated um, processes. So we did this a lot. You imagine, I mean, being me, I wanted to know comparatively how do cells differ from one another, um, what molecules are expressed, and how do they respond. And so we made lots of lines targeting all sorts of different structures in the brain and then went through and characterized these again in detail. So if you want to study the reticular nucleus in the thalamus, you know you're actually immunoprecipitating polysomes from the reticular nucleus. Um, if you want to study cholinergic interneurons in striatum, you can see them, record from them, know that there's cholinergic interneurons, and then you can immunoprecipitate and identify the expressed proteins. When you do that, you get what you might expect, um, and that is every defined cell type is, um, is characterized by a set of about 150, sometimes 300 genes whose expression defines that cell type. It doesn't mean that every gene in that 150 is cell specific, but in aggregate, they give you the phenotype of the cell. So somewhere in there, those, those genes, those proteins that are made, um, they dictate the fine-tuned properties of each cell type in the CNS. So that's quite interesting. Uh, now, of course, this is array methodology. We've done this for about 600 data sets. We have lots of data. It's all RNA-seq data. It has to be processed through the pipeline properly. Um, and this is challenging, but once it's in place, and I'm sure you all know about this, you then can look and you get beautiful data. So now we know from comparative analysis, if you compare 15 cell types and you identify the right markers, you can tell that your data is good and that you can tell the properties of these cells. Um, so this is fundamentally important for a lot of reasons, and I'd like to spend the rest of the time in the talk telling you a few projects that we use molecular profiling for. Um, again, the work was done primarily by uh, Miriam, but a lot of other people have been involved once the method was um, generated in trying to understand the properties of cell types. And again, it was collaborative with Paul Greengard. So then the question is, what do you do with this? I mean, with this technology? You know, what is it that you really want to study? And we're studying a lot of different conditions. The underlying principle for all of this is that if a cell undergoes a uh, a physiologic event that changes its activity or a pathophysiologic event that's negative for the cell, it will alter gene expression in response either as a consequence of that, direct consequence, or to compensate for such a pathophysiologic event. So today, out of the stuff we're doing in the lab, I'd like to just discuss four different projects briefly, um, show you what data we have for them, and then uh, we can discuss, you can ask questions about them later if you have additional um, things you'd like to probe. Two of these have to do with major depressive dif disorder, and two of them have to do with social uh, problems. So in the first case, um, I became interested in what's happening in the cerebral cortex in depression. Now, Helen um, Mayberg had shown by imaging, actually, that one of the major problems in major depressive disorder is that the balance of activity between the cerebral cortex and subcortical sites was abnormal. She also showed that if you are effectively treated by antidepressants, this normalizes the balance of activity to, between cortex and subcortical sites. Um, and that's extremely important because it says somewhere in cortex there is something important happening both during depression and during recovery from depression. 
So we wanted to know, is this a specific cell type? Does this occur in a specific cell type? To know this, we need two things. The first thing we need is a mouse model of depression, and Paul's lab, Paul Greengard's lab, had been working on this model, uh, the P11 model of depression, for some time. Um, and that model was nice because it both was depressed and did not respond to antidepressant treatment. So we thought we could map, in collaboration with his lab, both the cells in which the depressive-like behaviors are generated and then the um, antidepressant responses. So Eric Schmidt in the lab generated a whole series of cortical lines targeting different projection neurons in different layers of the cerebral cortex. So these are they. Um, and they're very nice line, trap lines where we can characterize the different cell types. And then what he did is take these things and characterize their projection patterns. And I'm going to show you one of them, the actually S100A10 line in which P11 is expressed, is present, it's present in layer 5A. Uh, and these cells from viral tracing studies um, project to the dorsal striatum, not to the accumbens, and they go cross-cortical to the other uh, side of the cortex. So this is an interesting candidate cell population, and what Eric did is profile them um, in response to anti in the in the mouse model and in response to antidepressant treatment. And what he found was really interesting. If you took cortical pontine cells, which we didn't think should have anything to do with depression, you treat those animals with antidepressants, they basically don't respond. You can't see any molecular events changing. They are in layer five, right next to the cortical striatal cells. Um, instead, if you look at the cortical striatal cells, you see uh, a strong response. The full changes in gene expression are two or three fold, but many genes are changing. So these cells are responding to the antidepressant and these cells are not. One of the interesting things he found is if he assayed all of these gene, effect, gene expression events, one of, the, one of the genes that changed actually maximally was the serotonin receptor 4. So that's important because, of course, SSRIs are increasing serotonin in the nervous system, and this could possibly uh, function in a positive feedback loop to normalize activity. So then the question is, OK, this is happening. These cells are responding. Um, what happens if you knock out P11 in the cortex? Do these cells still respond? Because P11 is a serotonin receptor uh, chaperone protein. Do they still respond? And what happens to behavior? And the results were very clear. If you then profiled them in the knockout, same cell type, they don't respond to chronic antidepressant treatment. In fact, very little happens to them. Um, if you assay their behavior, they behave normally, completely normally, but they no longer respond to antidepressants. So what Eric was able to show is that the cortical cell type that's responding to antidepressant treatment is actually these cortical striatal neurons that express P11. And this was a beautiful complement uh, to Jennifer Warner Schmidt's studies that showed that the, um, the actual depressive phenotype maps to the nucleus accumbens. So this is a nice example of um, biology in which there's a complex circuit. The mutation that causes the phenotype maps to one structure in the circuit, but the compensation for that and the treatment maps to another site. And it gave a very simple model where you treat with SSRIs. Serotonin is increased in the nervous system. Um, that increased serotonin is detected by these cells. Serotonin receptor 4 is induced in response to that. And now, because this is increased, there's enhanced sensitivity to the serotonin that's uh, increased in response to the SSRI, and you get this positive feedback in normalization of behavior. So the question is, is this right? Because if it's right, it's incredibly fortunate. I mean, you, you find something like that. So what Eric and Ramsey Carlos all are doing is this is the expression pattern of HTR4. Obviously, it's expressed in a lot of places. Can't be used as a target for antidepressant therapy because of its toxic side effects, although it does work, actually, as a rapid antidepressant. Uh, but they're knocking it out in cortex uh, to see whether, in flocks mice, to see whether 
that also will remove the antidepressant effect. And if it does, then this hypothesis that came from molecular profiling of this cell type in cortex in this situation um, actually is true. And finding something in that cell that can alter its activity, not HTR4, would be a very important strategy for trying to do, uh, develop new antidepressants. So that's the first story. The second story in depression has to do with a very well-known fact um, that stress can lead, can actually precipitate depression. So early life stress or actually acute stress in adult animals <coughs> can elicit depression in human beings. And Prana Shresna in the lab was very interested in this. We thought it might also be a cortical cell type. Um, and there's very nice evidence from a long history of morphologic studies from Bruce McEwen, John Morrison, and Patrick Hoff's lab that said if you stress animals uh, repeatedly, and in fact, this actually works in a, an acute model, if you stress animals repeatedly, then dendritic spines and layer 2, 3 neurons in frontal cortex are decreased. So there's a structural change. So what Prana thought is, well, maybe these cells are actually important combined, the stress combined in these cells with depression to cause uh, stress-induced depression. So what she did is take, and again, she profiled, she made a line, it's a neurotrophin factor 3 line that expressed only in layer 2, 3 cortical neurons in prefrontal cortex. And she profiled them. And she asked, are there any genes present in these cells that would give us a hint about what their function is, what might happen in stress or in depression? And she was lucky enough to find a gene called WFS1 that's specifically expressed in them. This is a gene that causes Wolfram syndrome. Now, Wolfram syndrome is interesting. It's a multi-system disorder. Um, but what's known about it in terms of behavior is that a large fraction of the people with Wolfram syndrome have psychiatric phenotypes, and a significant fraction of those people uh, have suicidal depression. The mice for Wolfram syndrome have depressive-like phenotypes. They have diabetes. They nicely replicate most aspects of the, of the disease. Um, and in a recent review of, Wolf, of major depressive disorder genetics, this gene is singled out as one of the genes that you can, that reliably causes major depression because in heterozygous carriers of Wolfram syndrome mutations, um, there's a significant increase in, depress in depression in these people, even though they don't have the multi-system disorder. So what Piranha thought is, well, let's make conditional alleles of this, knock it out in cortex, and see whether the depressive phenotype maps to cortex. So she did that. She generated antibodies and a conditional allele. The antibodies are very nice. And you can see the protein is expressed in layer two cells. It's expressed in CA1 hippocampal cells and in the amygdala and a few other sites in the brain. When she does the cortex forebrain specific knockout, you can see that you lose expression in the cortex and in the hippocampus, but you retain in the amygdala. So that's very nice. She's got uh, a structure-specific knockout. Again, if she looks at these mice by any behavioral test, they are totally normal. Uh, by, we're not experts on behavior, but we know how to do a lot of tests. Um, they're you know, basically the same as wild-type mice. But if you expose them to acute re restraint stress, um, then in this behavioral despair, assay for swim test or in anhedonia, there's a major phenotype. So in response to stress, these animals behave as if they're more depressed. Now, in this knockout, she knocked out in hippocampus and the entire cortex. So she decided, OK, let's try just medial prefrontal cortex, which is where the effects of stress are, have been mapped anatomically. And um, so she took viruses that express Cre, put them into her conditional allele and medial prefrontal cortex. And by doing that, she was able to replicate the phenotype. The mice are normal, but in response to stress, they exhibit enhanced depressive behaviors. 
Okay. So these cells in the prefrontal cortex are important for stress-mediated depressive behaviors. The question is, how does that work? Um, and so what she did first is stain um, <coughs> the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus, which is in the HPA axis, basically the stress pathway. And she was able to show that in these knockouts in response to stress, you got a massive increase in FOS staining, indicating an increase in activity, very easily observable. And this should lead to a change in serum corticosterone, and in fact it does. So the increase in corticosterone in response to um, acute restraint stress is much larger in these animals. Now remember, these are cortex deletions, and they're causing uh, peripheral increases in this, you know, in, in this um, stress hormone by activation of this pathway. So this is very nice because it fits very well into what's known about behavioral resilience, which appears to map at least partially to layer two, three cells in the medial prefrontal cortex. So this is another example, complex circuit, uh, Altering these cells for the behavior has very little effect, but this environmental influence of, of acute restraint stress reveals a phenotype uh, of basically a defect in their resilience to stress. So this kind of work where we're picking cells based on what's known in the literature and trying to connect the dots and assay molecularly um, what's happening in them is turning out to be very useful because without the molecules, we wouldn't know how to operate, I mean, how to manipulate the cells to reveal the functions in either a condition-dependent way. And again, this, this work was done, uh, the SSRI by Eric Schmidt and the stress studies by Prana Shrestha. Now, I'm gonna change gears a little bit because the next two stories come from fundamental biology, trying to characterize neurons. The first one, um, I'd like to tell you why we discovered 5-hydroxymethylcytosine and what we think it does. And it's interesting, when we published the paper, somebody drew this, issue, this picture. I have no idea what it's supposed to mean, but I like it, so I'm showing it. Um, so in 2009, we published a paper in, at the same time as in Jana Rao's lab that reported that there's a new modern modified base in mammalian genomes called 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. And she reported that it's present in ES cells and that it's uh, made by conversion of methylcytosine to 5-hydroxymethylcytosine by the TET enzymes. Since then, there have been literally hundreds of papers. And as Rudolph said, they're confusing. But I wanted to tell you why we, we actually discovered this and what we think it does in post-mitotic neurons. So, the issue that I was interested in was uh, an old observation, actually first made in light microscope a couple hundred years ago, but then very clearly illustrated when the electron microscope was used to characterize the nervous system, that um, cells like Purkinje cells, motor neurons, and pyramidal cells, which are large cells with lots of dendrite, have huge nuclei that are almost completely euchromatic. There's the only heterochromatin is observed around the nucleolus. Whereas small cells like granule cells in the hippocampus or in the uh, cerebellum look like basic cell culture cells. They have lots of clumped heterochromatin. The nuclei are small. Um, they're packed in. So my question was really simple, um, and that is, does this reflect a change in methylation? So since methylation is known to be present in heterochromatic regions, maybe all that's happening is these cells have less methylcytosine and therefore they're more euchromatic. Uh, and whatever this does for the cell, which must be important, um, actually would be revealed by looking at the level of 5-methylcytosine. So Skirmantis Crucianus in the lab decided, well, that's a good idea, we'll do this. The problem is the nuclei of these large cells are very rare. So this is only 0.2% of the total nuclei in Purkinje cells. And so what he had to do is use the trap mice, which have labeled nucleoli, and therefore you can fact sort the nuclei to isolate them. 
They isolated the genomic DNA from these two cell types, the ones with the large nuclei and then these small granule cells. Um, and he mapped by nearest neighbor analysis methylcytosine. What he found is that there's an additional nucleotide in this DNA. And it turned out through mass spec analysis and a bunch of experiments that I don't have to describe um, that this is 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. Now this, for me, this was really interesting because when I was in graduate school, I worked on bacteriophage that had this modification in them. Um, but it hadn't been seen in biology uh, in genomic DNA, particularly in mammals. So the question is really simple, you know, where is this? Is this in all tissues? Why hasn't it been seen? Schermatt has showed that it's very abundant in the nervous system, about 20-fold less abundant in other cell types uh, and in cultured cells. So, you know, obvious questions. Why is it so abundant? Um, where is it in the genome? How is it decoded? Is it involved in any diseases? And we took the simplest hypothesis, which is that this is an epigenetic mark that is read uh, in the cell differently than 5-methylcytosine and therefore is involved in a novel um, aspect of cell biology of neurons. So the first break breakthrough, I think, came when uh, Chuan He's lab generated this selective chemical labeling method for um, mapping 5-HMC in the genome. It's based on the fact that there are phage enzymes that will put a sugar residue on the hydroxyl group on 5-HMC, um, and then you can use that to biotin tag and pull down the HMC-containing DNA. And in gross brain tissue, if you do that, the level of 5-HMC is correlated with gene expression. So this is great because it said, well, this, there's some specificity to this. We want to see you know, how does this vary between cell types? How does it relate to gene expression? And we um, used the method, Marion Mellon did this, to map HMC in granule cells, the small compact nuclei, and in Purkinje cells. And she got a surprise, which is that in granule cells that have heterochromatin, 5-HMC is actually highly enriched over genes that are expressed. So this is an expression profile. This is HMC, okay, and it's, you know, very nicely enriched over expressed genes. In Purkinje cells, basically it doesn't change in the body of a gene, but the genes tend to be demethylated. So the first thing we learned is that this is a cell-specific signal. In some cells, it's being read uh, differently than in other cells. And you could do this, of course, genome-wide. <laughs> and what she showed is that in these large Purkinje cell nuclei, it doesn't correlate with gene expression, whereas in granule cells it does. Um, in Purkinje cells, demethylation correlates with gene expression much more, uh, much better than does 5-HMC. So uh, the bottom line of all this was that the gene expression, the function of HMC is different in different cells. And it's stably present. It, it correlates with gene expression in some cells and not others. Um, and its distribution is cell-specific. So the question becomes, you know, how is it decoded? And this is where things got really interesting and actually a little bit tense. So what Skirmantis, actually, this is a funny story. Um, Pinar Ayata in the lab was a student. And I was trained in Bob Rader's lab and didn't know how to do some biochemistry. So what we did is we did traditional column chromatography, ground up brains, look for HMC binding proteins the hard way. We didn't get anywhere. Skirmantis went in and just took some beads with HMC versus methyl C DNA on it. And he pulled down from crude extracts, frozen bought brain extracts. It almost killed me that he could do this. Um, and the simplest, cheapest, easiest, stupidest way to do things and what he found was uh, a band in both methyl C and HMC that could be pulled down that wasn't present if you use cytosine-containing DNA. He mass spec characterized that and found out that it's MECP2. Then he did a whole series of, uh, so Pinar took over. What she did is uh, she made Western blots, 
and then she probed them with HMC or methyl C containing DNA, confirmed his original result, and then she did a huge series of in vitro assays, and I want to explain this one because it's beautiful and she did a tremendous job. Um, so what she did is she took MECP2 made in coli and other methyl binding domains, um, and she asked, do they bind cytosine, methyl cytosine, or hydroxymethyl cytosine containing DNA? Simple experiment. Um, what she found is that the conventional methyl binding domain, methyl binding proteins, only bound uh, methyl cytosine in every case, but that MECP2 bound both methyl cytosine and hydroxymethyl cytosine. Same affinity, basically. So the question is, well, maybe there's something wrong with our probes because it seemed like this was really, you know, not definitive. So what she did was very simple. She took all of the probes <coughs> and she converted the HMC to a glucosylated HMC using this beta-glucosyl transferase. So now in this set, she has the beta-glucosyl transferase. We assume the protein couldn't recognize HMC anymore if it had a glucose on it. And the fact was, um, you do that experiment and you lose binding to HMC for MECP2. It doesn't affect methyl C binding because that nucleotide is not modified. So I think this is really convincing and definitive data that this protein can actually bind hydroxymethyl C and methyl C. And that's a conundrum because it's been described, and I think it's very well documented, that when MECP2 binds to methyl C, it's a repressor. So the question is, what does it do when it's binding to HMC? Um, so what we did is a whole series of chromatin digestions uh, and ask, you know, in this case, if you digest with micrococcal nuclease, you look at chromatin, What's released? Is HMC released first? The answer is yes. Is MECP2 released rapidly? The answer is yes. We did a whole series of these experiments, and I'm not going to go through them for you, um, but basically what they showed us is in, in neurons, 5-HMC is definitely enriched in accessible chromatin, so micrococcal nuclease accessible chromatin. That's true for both the heterochromatic nuclei and for um, the euchromatic nuclei. So uh, it's present in euchromatin. Secondly, when we did the um, comparison of MECP2 knockout in wild type granule cells, what we found is that many genes were dysregulated. This has been done in Rudolph's lab, Huda Zogby's labs, a lot of different labs. And the answer seems to be that. Lots of genes are dysregulated, very small fold changes. So this is not going to be a conventional activator or repressor, in, I don't think. Um, but that in granule cells, many of these genes, when you knocked out MECP2, were expressed at lower levels, suggesting that it somehow facilitates transcription, not that it represses transcription for that set of genes. Now, of course, you know this is a knockout. It could be direct or indirect, but that's the result. Um, and the, second, the third thing that she was able to show is that when you knock out MECP2, sort the nuclei, and do micrococcal nuclease digestions, um, the, you get much less accessibility to micrococcal nuclease. So the, the DNA is compacted in these cells in response to MEC, loss of MECP2. So I think the interpretation we had of this is pretty simple. When MECP2 binds to methyl C, um, it acts as a repressor, as Adrian Bird has shown and has, a lot of people have studied over the years. When it binds to HMC, we think that it facilitates transcription. Now, this is a really nice model. It says that this protein is somewhat like, let's say, a histone protein or an HMG protein. It's bound essentially all over the genome, but depending on where it's bound and what it's bound to, it can have a different downstream effect. Very nice. I thought it was, you know, sort of uh, solved until Chuan He and then uh, uh, Bala Subramanian's lab with Wolf Reich, they generated methodology to sequence uh, 5-HMC at a nucleotide-specific level. And 
Um, Joe Eckert's lab did this for, I guess it was whole cortex. He showed that there were massive changes, which isn't surprising. Well, we did this um, in our two cell types, and we got a result that really confused us, and I think it's going to occupy us for a little while. Uh, what we found is that, again, if you look at just gross HMC, it's present over active genes. So here's a gene expressed in granule cells. This is the nuclear transcripts. This is the messenger RNA. And HMC accumulates. All of the accumulated HMC are it's present in the CPG context. So this is HMCPG is accumulated. HMCPH is depleted. So, but, but it's present in active chromatin outside the gene. So now we have three cases. We have methylation, which is deposited heavily in heterochromatic DNA. We have HMCPG, which is present in actively transcribed genes. And we have HMCPH, which is present in active euchromatic regions but not in the transcription unit. So the problem is this introduces uh, a kink in the works because you know, the, what is happening? Is it that this signal and this signal are independently read? I think that the answer is certainly true because they accumulate in different places. And so what we've been asking recently is are there proteins that can distinguish HMCPH from HMCPG? The answer is yes. I can't tell you about them because we don't have definitive enough data. Um, but what I would say is that in heterochromatic nuclei, HMCPH is being read differently than HMCPG, and both of them are read differently than methyl C. So we have three marks, three different distributions, and probably three different mechanisms for regulating chromatin structure as a consequence. So as Rudolf said, the question is what does, HM, what does HMC do? Is it involved in transcriptional facilitation, I'd say, or repression? Is it involved in chromatin organization? Is it involved in neurons, at least in DNA demethylation? Beautiful work has been done here in Yi Zhang's lab and cultured cells. I would say we don't know. We don't really know what it does in neurons with any certainty. Um, if it's involved in DNA, whoops, if it's involved in DNA demethylation, it's locus specific and pretty rare because we see stable, uh, stable HMC for the life of the animal. I would bet it's involved in chromatin organization and its major role is to stabilize whatever phenotypes are generated in development in each neuron. There's good reasons why you need to stabilize uh, neuronal phenotypes um, so that the cells won't die or wander from their phenotype. And that's what I think it does, but we don't have evidence for that. So this work again was done, Schermontis discovered 5-HMC, Pinar discovered that MECP2 binded, Marion was the lead person mapping, and now Zhao and Francesco are taking up uh, the complexities of the single nucleotide distributions. So the last story I want to tell you is quite different, but it's still consistent with my interest in cell types. So this was a nice recent study that was done by Miho Nakajima. And when she came into the lab as a student, she thought, well, I'm going to profile all of the interneuron types and discover um, the additional interneuron types present in cortex, because it was already known that sort of the well-known groups weren't marked um, by individual markers. And what we wanted was to target each one of these classes. And in fact, I think there are many more interneuron subtypes than this um, in the mouse and characterize them. Since there weren't any good markers, basically, what Miho did is generate trap mice for let's say parvalbumin, which is expressed in fast-spiking interneurons and labels three different populations, um, and SST, somatostatin, which labels non-fast-spiking interneurons, HTR3A, which is a fairly specific class, et cetera, et cetera. And so she was going to use the comparative analysis of this to generate markers that would allow us to characterize uh, more refined subclasses and determine what their functions are. And the, <laughs> the 
the paper I'm going to tell you about was published last year. I wasn't around when it was published. It was out of the country or something. But we got this immediate response. The first part of it was really nice. It was this sort of this scientific looking stuff. But after a day, it got into all of the media around the world and it became amazingly entertaining because what she discovered is the neurons that regulate female sexual attraction to, uh, attraction to males. So I'm going to tell you this story, but these guys sat in the lab fielding phone calls from all these weird, you know, web places. I think, it, I think they had a blast. Okay, so here's the story. What Miho did is she took uh, NEX7, which is expressed in all fast spiking inner neurons, um, CORE, DLX1, and HCR3A, and she profiled them. Then she did comparative analysis of them, um, and she showed that, you know, she could identify markers that subdivided these populations. The one she was most interested in was the oxytocin receptor. This appeared to be expressed in a novel class of non-fast spiking, SST positive, somatostatin positive, regular spiking inner neurons. So she wanted to find out if that's true and what this inner neuron class does. So she generated a Cree recombinase line, which was expressed nicely in uh, scattered inner neurons in cortex. She characterized them with all of the known markers, and she was able to show that, you know, these inner neurons, 80% uh, of the cells targeted in this Cree line were inner neurons that were GAD1 positive, they were oxytocin receptor positive, um, they were uh, parvalbumin negative and SST positive, but it was a very small fraction of the total somatostatin population, which was known to already to label uh, several classes of inner neurons. So when we looked at the data by TRAP, it was clear that oxytocin receptor actually was enriched in these inner neurons, which by in situ was very difficult to tell, and again, that somatostatin was expressed in them. Looked very nice. So it looked like we had a clear, simple case where we found a marker that labeled a very specific subpopulation. Now, as Miriam's data had shown in the first studies, if you find this, it should be predictive. So Andreas Gorlick in the lab um, took these cells labeled in, in, in the Cree line, and he recorded from them. And what he found is that in slices at uh, without any stimulation, you know, they were, they were basically inactive. But that if you added oxytocin to these cultures, you got this robust firing. And so you could measure this quite easily. If you wash out the oxytocin, um, then the firing stops. So these are oxytocin responsive inner neurons in the medial prefrontal cortex. The second thing he found, which was quite interesting, is that if you did this in male in female mice, the responsiveness was different. Now, this is interesting because oxytocin, um, you know, the social impact of oxytocin was already known in humans, primates, and um, rodents to be more, to have a bigger impact on female than male animals. Okay, so this is nice. The cells are there, they express an oxytocin receptor, and they respond to oxytocin by increasing their activity. So then the question is, what do they do? And what Miho did is use this system that was generated by Inez Ibanez Tolon's lab in the MDC in Berlin, where you can take these viruses, Cree-dependent viruses, infect, and they will block calcium channel activity in those cells and block neurotransmission. It's very nice for long-term studies because it's totally non-toxic. Um, and it completely silences the cells, and they've done a nice job showing that. So what she did is do that, and she asked, well, what happens to these animals? Um, she's studying female mice because of the responsiveness of female animals to oxytocin, and asking about social behavior. And the social behavior is very simple. You take the animal, uh, habituate it, and then you ask, um, it's a female mouse, is it interacting with a male mouse, or more with a male mouse or more with, um, you know, an inanimate object. 
And for wild type mice, the answer is always it prefers the mouse. Um, but for these silenced mice, the results were very inconsistent. If you did it every day for six days, in some cases it would prefer the mice, and in some cases it would pref not prefer, but uh, yeah, in some cases it actually prefer the Legos. This is confusing, except for that it's known in the liter that literature that oxytocin is responsive to estrogen. So what Miho did is take another cohort of mice, and this time she tested them, and she also took swabs to determine what stage of estrus they were at. And what she found is that um, silencing the neurons had no effect on social behavior during diestrus. It had no effect uh, on behavior towards female mice. But in estrus, when female mice are most responsive sexually to male mice, uh, if you silence these neurons, they no longer are interested in the male mice. It's very reproducible, very easy to uh, determine, and so it appeared to her that these neurons are involved in this very specific social sexual behavior. So the question became, well, these are oxytocin receptor expressing neurons. Is it dependent on oxytocin? And the answer is yes. Um, she did that again by taking creviruses, um, injecting them into the medial prefrontal cortex of o conditional oxytocin receptor mice, and she showed that by doing just the prefrontal cortex, um, she could reproduce this phenotype. The female mice in estrus were no longer interested in male mice. She could also take a known, actually well-characterized oxytocin receptor antagonist, infuse that into prefrontal cortex, and show exactly the same phenomena. So what this did is establish that this very small population of interneurons um, you know, is a novel class. It's relatively uniform um, and very sparse. So it's less than 1% of the total neuron population, but it can tile over medial prefrontal cortex. Um, so what she showed is this is a novel class. We, we don't know whether this is a cell type because nobody knows what a definition of a cell type is, but these are um, functionally and molecularly coherent subpopulation of SST expressing um, interneurons. These cells participate in a latent circuit. They don't do anything unless the mice are in uh, estrus, and then they alter the attractiveness of male mice for these mice. So this is really interesting, and I think this kind of molecular analysis where you, you define a cell type, you find molecules that may be important for modulating it, and then you test it and assay what happens to behavior is a really good approach because if we didn't know about oxytocin receptor and we just had these things um, targeted, we wouldn't know what to assay. We wouldn't know to assay uh, social behavior, we wouldn't know to assay female social behavior, and we wouldn't know to assay it during estrus. So I think the molecular cues you get from the profiles are very important. Now, um, as a lot of you probably know, uh, oxytocin is being tested in clinical trials um, for actually a number of different social disorders, including autism. It does have an impact. So I think one interesting issue is you know, are these cells active under other circumstances where oxytocin is being modulated? Anybody who knows about this field knows that oxytocin levels vary in many different social conditions. Um, in general, men are less sensitive to oxytocin than females, but they're not insensitive. So it's quite possible that this interneuron population has other roles in modulating behavior, social behavior, um, and either in response to other cases of oxytocin modulation or in response to other pathways that impinge on them, and we don't know what those pathways are. So we're studying them. Um, it's also possible that part of the effect of oxytocin nasal spray is uh, mediated by these cells in, in the cortex. Now, one thing I'd like to stress is we did this in medial prefrontal cortex. These cells are spread over the entire cortex. So what they're doing in other parts of the cortex, what modulates them, what downstream behaviors they modulate, are all open questions that we can ask using the methodologies we have.
And so I guess I'd like to close just by saying that this work was done by Miho Nakajima and Andreas Gorlich. Uh, Andreas and Miho did a wonderful job on this. Uh, Kun Lee is now working on different aspects of this oxytocin-dependent behavior and mechanism. And I'll just leave you with the names of the people who are in the lab who have done a lot of this work. Thank you. So, questions? Hazel. You know, um, the disclaimer that who knows what a cell type is, you know, it's kind of interesting because I was going to ask you on the basis of your, your um, gen set and your track profiling if you could comment on the number of cell types in the nervous system so I could tell my introductory biology class. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there are more than 500. The problem becomes, um, I can give you what we operationally use as a, as a definition. Cells that look the same, um, when they're measured electrophysiologically, they have the same properties, although that's not a very precise measure. Um, and when we profile them and isolate the, the messenger RNAs that are expressed in them, if we then do in situ hybridization back onto the population, onto the brain, we can't subdivide them. So they express the same cohort of genes, have the same morphology, and the same projection pattern, or in the case of interneurons, firing properties. I would call that operationally a cell type. And if you use that kind of definition, there are certainly hundreds of cell types in the brain, probably over 500. Um, some people would argue that you know, there's a million cell types in the brain because if you do two different Purkinje cells and measure things precisely enough, they will be different. And I don't accept that argument because I think all cells have sets of genes that are responsive to the environment. And so depending on what's happening in that cell type, one individual of the cell type could express different genes than the other. That doesn't mean it's a different cell type. So I would say, I don't know what Miriam thinks, but that's what I think. We, you know, this is going to be a debate that goes on for a long, long time. And depending on whether you're a splitter or a lumper or in between like me, there's certainly at least hundreds of cell types. So, um, the, have you looked at the protein uh, complexes that on the 5MC uh, and 5MHC? Uh, you will assume, you, I assume it will be very, you will see very different protein composition. Yeah, you know, we have done a lot of biochemistry, none of which is particularly convincing outside of MECP2. And I think that the way these marks work, is more like a histone, where you have one protein that's binding two substrates, methyl C and HMC. But depending on what it's bound to, it will receive different post-translational modifications that will then dictate what its function is. So, like different histone marks. It's, these are very abundant, MECP2 is very abundant. I mean, it's almost as abundant as histone H1. It binds all over the genome if you do chip assays. Um, and it's certainly enriched in euchromatin that is enriched in HMC in some cells. So I think you should think of it more as a chromatin protein, a generic chromatin protein like a histone or HMG, and that depending on what it's bound to, it will have do different downstream effects based on post-translation modifications. It doesn't require them, though, to bind to HMC and methyl C differentially because we can make the protein in E. coli and it'll bind to both uh, substrates. So I think it's much more likely that it binds, then gets modified, and then that does something to chromatin structure than the other way around. Um, when we looked, there, we got several other candidates that will bind HMC with some affinity, but much less affinity than MECP2 and much less abundant protein. So, and the distribution of HMC, you know, it's not really localized. I mean, it's in the entire gene body, introns, exons, everything, or it's extragenic in the entire extragenic region. It doesn't seem to be in 
in neurons enriched in enhancers or promoters. In fact, it's depleted from promoters, and it's depleted from heterochromatin. So I think of it as a much more generic chromatin structural protein that's recognizing two different substrates with two different downstream effects. Um, there's a mass spec paper where somebody isolated a huge number of HMC binding proteins. You know, that's, you can do that experiment. We've actually done it. Um, but confirming those as actually being important in vivo uh, is a difficult task. I would say as a disclaimer, we don't actually know that MECP2 binds HMC in vivo. It's a really difficult experiment. I mean, it certainly distribution would suggest it. Um, but to prove that, that it actually binds in vivo, when you get chip assays that show it all over the genome, it's quite difficult. So we're in the midst of it. We have really nice approaches, but we don't have definitive data. Is there a specific enzyme that adds this mark that you can just delete in the brain and see what happens? There are three. Rudolph's deleted all of them. <laughs> Maybe you could say something about that. Um, you know, if you, if you do triple knockouts, has major effects. Um, single knockouts have more less dramatic effects. None of them knock out, no single knockout uh, destroys HMC distribution in, in these cells. So we're now analyzing cells specifically, the same thing that Rudolph has done on whole brain, uh, whole tissue, and we'll see. But I, I don't think, yeah, I think if you knock all three of them out, you're gonna have severe effects, and we still won't know what happened. So the approaches we're taking are to tag really do single molecule analysis on MECP2 and see where it binds uh, by visualization in vivo. The prediction if our model is right is if you do this in mature neurons, you would de-differentiate them? If you think that it maintains some state of a neuron? Um, I, so, I think what it does, no, I think over time it might degrade their phenotype, but not instantly. So. Basically, I mean, the major question is why do you have this nucleotide and why do you have MECP2 and why are they restricted in high abundance to neurons that are post-mitotic in long-lived organisms? That's the question. And I think the answer is that if neurons wander from their phenotype, they die. That's pretty well documented. If you try to drive them into cell cycle or anything like that, they will die. Um, so you can't afford over the years of the life of a neuron, and in our case is hopefully you know, 60, 70, 80 years, you can't, affect, you can't afford for their phenotype to be very variable because it will trip the threshold for cell death and they will die. So I think what it is is it has really no primary effect in setting up gene expression events in the cell or in regulating them acutely, but I think it actually just stabilizes whatever phenotype is achieved through development and cements it in place so that you don't get these aberrant gene expression events that would be dis detrimental to the cell. Now, that's really hard to prove because, for example, if we knock it out in adults, you wouldn't see anything uh, unless there was some untoward event that happened. And so we're trying to characterize this actually in, in specific human cell types through aging. And I think that could be quite revealing. Um, mice just don't live very long. You know, they live longer than a lot of other things, but not very long. So I, it'd be really nice to know what happens to these profiles over decades of human life and see if sort of they get more ragged as things go on. And maybe that's why I can't remember anything. So coming to the methylation of there has been a suggestion that methylation in gene bodies correlates with expression rather than another research. Have you seen that many No. When we look at specific cell types, demethylation correlates with gene expression. In, in gene bodies. In gene bodies, yeah. And um, non-CPG methylation basically isn't present. We don't, it, it must be present at some stage, but I think almost all of it is converted to HMC, not CPG. So um, the bottom line for expressed genes 
is that they have very little methylation of any type in the gene body. Not very, I mean, much less than any other region of chromatin. But they still have some methyl groups there. Yeah. So, so that's, I guess, a bit different than some of the other studies that you showed uh, that had done seeing the grid type based pair resolution methylation profile, finding that there is quite a bit of non CPG methylation. Is that right? There's non CPG methylation. Yeah, in neurons, adult postmitotic neurons, we see almost none. Okay. There's CPG methylation is obviously. That's really active. Yeah, yeah, that's really. But I think I think it is active. It sets up, you know, non-CPG methylation, and basically over the life of the neuron, all of it could converts to HMC. So. I, I just don't think that's consistent with any of the studies you showed. So the Lister study and the Z study both they show actually show that it's actually at a very high level in the adult neuron. Not CPG methylation. You know, I mean, we could debate this forever, but TabSeq is an enzymatic method for mapping, and OXBS is a chemical method. And basically, what they showed is they couldn't see uh, a bias in non CPG, and we see a strong localization of non CPG methylation by OXBS. So we have TabSeq data. The TAPSEQ data doesn't look very good for non-CPG. So I don't know what the answer is, but I can tell you that if you do chemical oxidation, almost all of the non-CPG methylation is converted to HMC by that method. And I think it makes sense, and it can't be random because its distribution is different. So, and it changes in, in specific cell types. Um, so I don't know what the answer is, but I think our data argues that most of it is converted to HMC. So as, as a proportion of all of the hydroxymethyl C, I think you showed that uh, for Kinji cells, 40% uh, of all modified cytosines are hydroxymethyl cytosines. Uh, how does that break down with hydroxymethyl CG and hydroxymethyl CH? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question in for Kinji cells, I, because we don't have the data yet. Um, in granule cells, still most HMC is CPG. Most of it is still CPG. But in gene bodies, non-CPG is depleted. So if you looked at the whole genome, remember, expressed genes are a very small fraction of the genome. If you're looking at the whole genome, the ratio of the whole genome, I don't know what it is, but it doesn't have to be biased towards non-CPG. Uh, but in gene bodies, when you map non-CPG uh, methylation is not present, and non-CPG HMC is not present. When you look at euchromatin, <coughs> non-CPG methylation is still not present in our data, but non-CPG HMC is present. So our results don't match the Lister results, which was done on whole brain. And, so I don't know what the answer is, but I'm pretty sure data is very reproducible and the distributions look real. So I think DNMT3A makes the non-CBG uh, methyl, and over time, in differentiated cells, it's just converted by the test HMC. So maybe we should last question. Um, yeah, just to ask Troy's question the other way around. Um, have you tried overexpressing the enzyme in, let's say, more immature cells and see whether you can stall the development in a way? No. I mean, there's lots of manipulations that um, can be done. For example, you could glucosylate all of the HMC in the cell and see if you blocked that residue, what would happen. Um, I think I like, you know, loss of function much better. And there's a lot of work going on. We have some of the mice and we're going to do it in a cell specific way and see what happens. Um, so the answer is we haven't done that experiment. And we're basically going to work with Rudolph's knockouts and, and see if we can figure out what's happening from that. Okay, there's some wine I think also. Okay, thank you.